Sri Lanka is one united nation again and fast on its path to a new future. A future for which a generation of Sri Lankans have paid for dearly, some with the ultimate sacrifice. The Sri Lanka Rupawahini Corporation, being the premier television network in Sri Lanka, consider it our duty to be actively involved in the formulation of that future. Thus, we bring you Checkmate. The stories of some extraordinary people who have gone that extra mile, set out that extra hour to achieve success in very ordinary circumstances. So that you too may be encouraged to aspire for such greatness. Checkmate, a new Sri Lanka, together we can. Hello everyone and welcome to another program of Checkmate. Uh, before we uh, go on to introduce our, our guest tonight, I must firstly thank all of you, particularly our viewers who have been constantly with Checkmate and the Checkmate ethos for making Checkmate a successful program. I am told by my production team that the ratings have climbed uh, in, in an amazing fashion. The, the day, everyday viewers and people joining in on our Facebook page are increasing rapidly. And the general response that we get on Checkmate and what it is speaking out to present and future Sri Lankans in this rebuilding of our nation uh, is, is amazing. And thank all of you. I thank all of you from the bottom of our hearts. There is a, a big production team behind this success. And all of us here at Rupa Wahini Corporation take much pleasure, a very humble pleasure, in, in thanking you for your response. We are encouraged to serve you more. Uh, we are not inflated in any manner by the response we've got. It just shows us that there is a demand for the sort of dialogue that you're bringing to your houses and we are encouraged to give you more in a better way in future programs of Checkmate. So thank you very much. You'll find our Facebook page appearing at the bottom of the screen and our email address. Do keep writing in. I'm particularly thankful to our viewers overseas who I know are up at odd times watching us. Thank you very much. And I have some good news for you. The production team informs me that very soon we will be live online so that even those of you who don't have access to our regular programs will be able to watch us online very soon. So thank all of you. And we are once again encouraged by your response. And we thank you on behalf of the Checkmate production team. Um, tonight, our guest is, uh, is somewhat different uh, in, in this sense. As you know, over our uh, previous programs, we've been discussing the various organs of government, the sovereign power of the Sri Lankan citizen being vested in temporarily in temporary custodians, the judiciary, the legislature, the executive. But today, we're going to talk of not these three organs of government, but the sovereign servant or the state servant, or the public servant. The difference between these temporary custodians of people's sovereign power, but the servant of the state. Sometimes there's a misconception that a state servant becomes a government servant. All of this we are going to discuss, and who better to discuss this than our very own, arguably unmatched and unparalleled record of over five decades, of 50 years service as a public servant, he served under nine heads of state, nine heads of state, seven prime ministers, uh, and constantly throughout that service, never became a government servant, but remained a state and public servant. His first degree was in economics and sociology. He was a Fulbright scholar to Michigan for his master's degree. And I speak of our very own Deshamanya, Robin Bradman Virakon. I born Mr. Virakon, and uh, welcome to Checkmate. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we start all our stories where all stories start, at the advent. This is our little profile session where we speak of your formative years and your, your childhood, your school. Um, on the 30th of October, 1930, 
there were two advents to Sri Lanka. <laughs> One, the great Don, the Sir Donald Bradman, uh, the cricketer, had come to Sri Lanka, shipped himself to Sri Lanka, and then, of course, ah, Don, uh, Bradman, <laughs> ah, Mr. Bradman Virakon comes, uh, is born in Sri Lanka. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your childhood? Right. Shall we start with the birth? <laughs> we'll start with the birth. Everybody asks me that question, and it is a is a useful icebreaker sometimes. Of course. How were you named Bradman, or why were you named Bradman? And as you indicated, it happened because of a coincidence that Don Bradman, after this uh, great record-breaking stay he had in uh, England, mm. was coming through Sri Lanka, yeah. Ceylon, mm. and the ship docked in at Colombo Harbour. Mm. My father happened to be a, not only a, a great fan of Australian cricket and a cricketer, but uh, also was in the, in, in, in the harbour at that time. He was working in the police. He went on board the ship, he says, I mean, I don't know anything about this, I mean, he, I have to believe him, got Don Bradman's autograph and then found out when he went back to his office that his wife had born a child a male child, and he could think of no other name but Bradman. Bradman. <laughs> and that's how our Bradman that's came how to our be. Man. And you're a Thomian. Uh, you want yeah. to speak a little bit about your student life as a Thomian? Yes, I think one of the most fortunate, in a way, accidents happened when uh, our school, which is at Mount Lavinia, was taken over for a hospital in 1942. The, the Japanese, as you might remember, were about to invade mm. and everybody was Security concerned yeah. about, about getting out of Colombo. And this school shifted, in, broke into three, mm. and the branch that I went to and I was educated at happened to be in the hills, yes. in the Uwa Hills, in a beautiful, wonderful village called Gurutalava. Yes. There was a farm there mm. and we went into this farm, mm. 35 of us at that time, mm. others went into other places. And I had, I think, the most exciting four or five years of my childhood there. Yes. You have to be in boarding school <laughs> of to really appreciate yes. Yes. You know, what you get out of a school. Yes. A day scholar gets some kind of a, a sense of the... But not the complete picture as, complete a, as a boarder would get. Particularly at St. Thomas's where, where, where that, that whole um, eating ethos, if you like, from England. This Absolutely. It was an ethos of, you know, Endurance, survival, uh, toughness. The so-called Thomian grit. Perhaps. Yes. I mean, it yes. emerges sometimes. Yes. Yes. But it, that's, that's the kind of yes. spirit in which you were, you, you, you were nurtured at that time. Yes. You know, it, it stood me personally in very good stead. I'm always grateful for that yes. five years. It hasn't done you that badly. Um, Mr. Mirakon, you also, in your memoirs, which we will be referring to in detail later, you also speak very fondly of your family, your father, your mother was a teacher, I believe. Maybe you'd like to speak a little bit about your parents and your family, then maybe of your wife, Damayanti, and the children, Asala and Krishanti, and right. your present family. Right. My father was, a, as I said, a policeman, yes. a very strict disciplinarian, yes. and he imposed great discipline even at home. Mm. But my mother was quite gentle with us, you know, and, and I think we always ran to her when we had to escape the whatever the father was going to do to us, <laughs> which was often. Yeah. But it was a nice combination. My mother was quite artistic. Mm. She was uh, an arts teacher, as, as I knew her, mm. and could always develop painting, music, um, interest in drama, art, and so on. Mm. Mm. My father was much more on the, on the kind of police side of mm. discipline and sports. And now of your uh, present family, I know your, uh, your dear wife, Damianti, has passed away. But you, you have two children, uh, Asala and Krishanti, and you have grandchildren also. Maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about your family. Well, I really have one child only. I have, I have right. only Asala. Krishanti is his wife. Right. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, and uh, I have two grandchildren. Yes. So he's done better than I did <laughs> in the way of production of children. Right. But these two grandchildren are, are great. You know, they are sort of 22 and 21 now, and yeah. they are the ones who keep me going with yeah. all the new gadgets. And the you spend much time with them? Pretty much of time when I can, and, mm. and, and now they are once abroad, yeah. so he's emailing me or <laughs> talking on Skype and keeping me up to date. Right. 
they think I'm, I'm what they call techno savvy. <laughs> and, and the reason is that they've been responsible for that a lot of the time. Of course. No, I, I know that we have lots to discuss. And I must tell our viewers that once again, the length and breadth of this gentleman's exposure to the area that, that we're discussing is too much for us to handle in one program. We have to go on to two programs. And so we will have to come back to the studios again for you and record the second part of our program. But uh, today we're going to cover as much ground as possible. But Checkmate will filter on to another episode of the following week with Deshamani Bradman Virakon. But before we get to the real nitty gritties mm -hmm. of, of the topic as it were, maybe you'd like to speak a little bit about your writing. You've, you've, you've turned out uh, with several publications as well subsequently a little. Yes. I know one is uh, Rendering Unto Sears. Yes. Uh, yes. Your tenure of nine heads of state That's and right. seven prime ministers. Right. And, and um, yeah, so several publications. Yes, actually. well, at least two or three major ones, I think I would call them. Uh, rendering unto Caesar is really my my work with the prime ministers and presidents, and I thought it was an appropriate uh, kind of phrase of coming out of the Bible and of so on, which which I used to be familiar with. Yes. Uh, and what what it tries to do is to get a biographical view of of these people and and and, and their greatness. I mean, mm. they were all as great as Caesar, mm. and I was doing what I could. To, 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 go, to help them go mm. on with, the, with their work. Mm. So that was, it's a service. Mm. But I think there is a little hidden meaning too in rendering unto Caesar. Because mm. I think the phrase says that you render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. Jesus. And unto God that which is God. Yes. And God is, the, is your conscience. Yes. And, yes. and I think I don't, uh, I, I make the point that I, I, don't, I don't do everything. Of course you do. And, and that, that is very much the, will be the focal point of our discussion. But just to, just to set the stage, Mr. Villacorn, um, before we get on to a quick break and our next segment, um, this public service mm -hmm. or state service, as you knew it, as you went to, has over the years undergone several changes. Of course, we are going to be in detail discussing each tenure late, mm -hmm. but just for us to start off, maybe in a couple of minutes, what do you perceive of the public service that you entered? Like I said, over the years, people have come to confuse these two terms of a public servant or a state servant as opposed to a government servant. Governments, as we know, come and go, but the state service or the public service must continue. That's how it was meant yes. to be. Your comments on it, very briefly, before we get in depth into it, yeah. brief comment. I, I, think, I think I got right into that idea of public service through the fact that I was fortunate enough to be selected into the civil service. You know, at that time, there was a the very special civil service. Yeah. Civil service. Uh, composed largely of, 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 of Englishmen, yes. and then later it became Sri Lankan as well. But that service gave you a certain, um, you know, tradition of how you should act in the performance of public duty, and they, they were very strict on those codes. Yes. And the public servant at that time had to combine his loyalty to an administration mm. with doing his duty by the people, mm. and we had the sense that. Over and above the government of the day, there was in the background the public itself. And if at any time, in your view, there was a conflict between these two, you had to move towards the public. And the Stay. defense of the public lay in your hands. Yes. Unfortunately, with the, with, the, with the concept of state service or government service, I think government people now begin to feel that the public service, public servants that they have are their own yes. to control and do what they like with. Yes. And that they forget that they have an obligation mm. deeper and broader mm. to the political, the political power. That yes. is, which is temporary, as you said. Yes. Yes. It's in held, power is held in trust on the election for the public, for a, for a purpose. But that purpose is to serve the public. Yes. And I think if public servants get that a little more clearly in their mind today, uh, the public itself would be better served. Yes. So that's, that's an area that we will be uh, going uh, deeper into. That's just a, 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 a sign, if you like, of what we are going to be discussing on our two programs, not one with Deshamani Bradman Virakun. But before I go to a quick, quick break, I'm going to leave you with these thoughts, not published by him, but published of him. Uh, it's uh, Rendering Unto Bradman is, 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 is the title of the book. But uh, just um, something that is quoted of him from one of his deliveries that I'd like to leave you with on this concept that he just promulgated to us 
of a civil servant or a public servant of yesteryear. He speaks of the time that after a particular change of regime, when he was no longer the secretary to the head of state, but he was sent on a transfer. And this is what Mr. Virakon writes there. One personal thought on which I will end. After serving the, the center with prime minister for 16 years continuously, I was at one it, I was at one change of government moved to the outstations. This I thought was perfectly natural. It was okay, but I was strongly advised that one could put a claim for political victimization. I didn't see anything in what happened that victimized me. I saw a straightforward change, a transfer, which all of us are entitled to or eligible for. And it happened finally after 16 years in one place. I think a lot is being made of so-called victimization without there being an attempt to look at causes and reasons. Sometimes people who have got a leg up on promotions which are undeserved would think that they were victimized when they just went down to base. <laughs> so these are the words of the man that we are in the company of which are privileged and honored sir to be in your company. There's much to discuss with you but this was the public servant or the civil servant of yesteryear. That's the subject of discussion on Checkmate. Don't go away. We'll be back shortly. Hello and welcome back to Checkmate. As you know, we're in the company of Deshmanya Bradman Virakon, a civil servant, a public servant par excellence. And we start with his first tenure. That is, uh, sir, I believe, with under the premiership of Sir John Kotala, 54 to 56. Yes. Um, this was immediately in the aftermath of independence, 48, 56, we, we've come to. There would have been lots of changes at the time, lots of changes taking place from the colonial times to, to an independent, well, not fully independent perhaps, but uh, not the 72 Republican independence, mm -hmm. but certainly changes of a, of a new nation born. A few, few thoughts on the time. Changes, but not, not dramatic changes, I would think. Because the, 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 the first few prime ministers, and particularly after Sir John, it was D.S. Sinanayaka, Dudley, and then Sir John, mm. they seemed to be more or less in the same mold mm. as what went on earlier. Mm. The condition had changed. We yeah. were a free country. Yeah. But in terms of dress, for example, if you look at the dress that D.S. Sinanayaka wore, mm. and particularly Sir John wore, was the Western? pretty councillors, yeah. coat and tails, yes. yeah. sometimes even top hat. Right. You know, which, which looked incongruous right. for a free country. Of course. But at least it was a transition, a slow, gradual transition yes. going on. Yes. Sometimes imperceptible. I mean, you didn't even know that it was changing. Yes. But uh, the, some signs were there, the symbols were there. and yes. it, it didn't look like a great dramatic change. Yes. The dramatic change came later. But Sir John yes. was in a way... A, a person of the of the of the of the, ancien, of the ancien regime, right, hmm? right, and uh, he was a uh, somewhat different from what is popularly made out to be. Hmm. He was not the playboy, you know, all the time. Yes, he played around yes. a bit. Yes, but some of the time he was very hard working. Yes, I mean he could work hard. Yes, he could be quite a martinet at uh, discipline of getting things done. Right, he right. would say things like, "I light the." pathway up to Adam speak <laughs> and get it done, you know, right. get it done. Right. I mean, he would, right. he would be like that. So he was so a worker. A man of action yes. also, yes. man of action. Yes. And, and I, I, I just like to uh, point you out uh, in your memoirs, um, you speak uh, very, fun, very fondly of the time that uh, a, a response to uh, Prime Minister Nehru mm -hmm. came, from, came from Sir John. This had been often quoted. I think this was in, on the eve of, of a speech uh, where Prime Minister Nehru found that certain things that uh, were said in the speech by Sir John should have perhaps been shared with him. You want to <laughs> recite the story to us? Yes, I think it was at Bandung, it was the Bandung conference. Yes. And uh, China was, uh, you know, was, was in, in, in with the non-aligned and Sir John didn't particularly like that because he yes. said that China did not deserve to be, to be there right. at that time. Yes. And he was going on about what China had been doing in expansion and Tibet and so on. Yes. And Nehru, who was very much for this Panchasila, yes. close relations with China yes. at that time, was, was quite upset yes. and uh, told Sir John, why didn't you show me your speech? <laughs> yes. And Sir John made a very classic retort. You know, he said, 
I will show you when you show yours to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I may be the smaller neighbor next but, door, but, anyway. but, but you and I are, are equally Even placed. There. Yes, I mean that that, that shows the, the 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 quality of the leader. That that uh, the quality of the man, and also I think that kind of relationship which Sri Lankans had towards India. Here was a elder brother, big and so on. Mm. But who, who perhaps thought that you ought to have shown exactly, me the speech before but you went. Exactly, but don't get a little yeah, too far in, yeah, in that, yeah, you know, yeah, up to yeah. a point. Yeah, but, but yeah. I'll, show, I'll uh, show mine if you show yes, me yours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Well, uh, we go on after that to, uh, I mean, that once again, uh, you, you serve a, a uniquely different Prime Minister, if you like, 56 to 59 where Prime Minister Bandarnaik, mm -hmm. S.W.R.D. Bandarnaik, Stenio. Now that would have obviously been a shift for you, uh, a, quite a shift. Do you want to speak a little bit about yeah, the change? That, that was completely different. I mean, there was the real change. If you think of a change between the colonial setup and then later on the independence. Hmm. And in fact, Mr. Bandarnaik was the one who, at independence itself, if you hmm. recall, 1948, hmm. who made that marvelous speech. He was. He was uh, seconding, I think, the speech from the throne. Yes. And he came out with those wonderful words about how we were a free nation and yes. so on. Yes. So at that point of time, when to see Mr. Bandarnak actually live up to that, mm. Mm. come out in very simple clothes, his, the national dress mm. Mm. was what he wore, mm. completely moved away from that whole colonial tradition of mm. great parties with liquor and mm. so on, mm. into mm. no liquor at all. Mm you know, a kind of indigenous uh, getting away from the West, mm. which was quite quite um, well, well seen and well received mm. by people. Mm. It was apparent in Parliament, uh, the fact, the, the kind of people that supported him in Parliament, his members of Parliament. Mm. Mm. And the, actually the, the, the common man was the kind of phrase that was on, mm. that this was now the era of the common man. Mm. Mm. And yes. he, in a so sense, fact you make, you make, made uh, it happen. Yeah. You mentioned that. In fact, uh, uh, on, in your memoirs, you, you, you say this, um, his eloquence as a speaker, mm -hmm. especially uh, in his Independence Day uh, speech, which you just adverted to, and the skills of perseverance in the face of severe odds, and the ability to persuade large masses of ordinary people to believe in his cause. Uh, what was this different attribute in him? I mean, how, how did he manage to do it? How, how was it possible? But he had tremendous verbal skills, you know, his, his dexterity in both languages. But surely he was an English-educated Oxford scholar. I know, but he had learned the other, the hard school, you know, he had gone into, 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 the, into the, the temples, he'd gone there. He'd made the effort to become a brilliant orator, even in Singhala. Mm -hmm. and, and this surprised me, he could, mm -hmm. he could do a, a whole chapter, as it were, Hmm. of words, hmm. and then the next moment turn it back and repeat it in Singhala, hmm. Hmm. keeping the same tempo right through. Hmm. And it was a remarkable attribute that he had. Yes. And it's no wonder that when you, when you look back at his Oxford days, hmm. he talks about this ability yes. to mesmerize his audience. He the talks about the amazing. power. Yes. It's, it's a wonderful memory that he has. Yes. That's how he held the whole union spellbound. Yes. And I don't doubt it, I yes. because you have to only listen to him to... to you, you've seen it. I've seen it happen yes. in action. Yes. But then, uh, once again, um, in, in your memoirs, you, you, we, we get the impression, you, you speak of perhaps a little bit of trepida trepidation on, um, on some serious business that had to be attended to, whilst all that was good. Here was some serious business of state at hand. There was also the serious business to be faced on how soon he would be able to make his election slogan mm. of Singhala only as the official language. Now, Mr. Um, Mirakon, uh, people have spoken both good and bad of the Singhala only bill. Some even attribute that to a root cause of mm. our several problems. You were there at the time. What is your, now in hindsight, what is your view on this whole? Yeah, I, I think he very definitely had the, had the idea that the single only bill would be followed fairly soon by a reasonable use of Tamil. Hmm. That second part of it couldn't come into action that fast. Hmm. He was trying to do that, particularly through the discussions with Mr. Chelvanagam. He was trying hmm. to do it through, uh, through that pact that they had, the Chelvanagam Bandanaka pact and hmm. so on. Hmm. But I think the forces that uh, impelled 
mm. single only, mm. were then so strong mm. that he felt that it may not be propitious to do it just then. Mm. And so he delayed. Mm. And I think this was one of the little weaknesses that he had, mm. that he didn't want to face the, the, the music as it were, which would develop if he had done that too fast. Mm. He wanted to keep some time for single only mm. and then modify it or moderate it. Mm. He was a moderate man. He was not an extremist. Mm. I mean, mm. single only normally would give one the feeling that this was some kind of a very ardent nationalistic person. Mm. He wasn't because, as you said, mm. he mm. was imbued very much with the liberal democratic traditions which he came out of the, of the English traditions. Mm. And, and your tenure during that time, where exactly were you placed during, during this service? I happened, strangely, to, to be a very young secretary to the Prime Minister. Yes. Because the, the secretary, who was a senior person, had been sent out with a change of government. Mm. I had not been at that time, you know, long enough to be associated with a particular government. Yeah. So nobody yeah. thought that I was a UNP person That's working with Sir John, yeah. working with uh, yeah. Mr. Banana. Yeah. And he just took me on. As yeah. a, as so, so coming from one Prime Minister to the other, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to refresh your mind. I know all these things are there in your mind, seven Prime Ministers, nine leaders. So I'm, I'm going to quote from here and there mm -hmm. of your memoirs. You say that the year 1956 saw a first real change of a regime the young state has ever faced. The popular mood mood was such that everything was to change. The way institutions were run, mm. certainly the persons manning them, the Mahajan Exat Peramun manifesto promised a revolutionary change from the way the UNP had governed the country, the first nine years of freedom. So what was, just tell us some of these changes that were taken, the, the changes that you speak of. What were these changes and now how did that come into your area of interaction? Mm. Yeah. I think it was, it was the whole business of uh, looking at more what was the national way of doing it, what was the past historical tradition to do it. I mean, if it was a question of health, it was how to give an equal place, say, to Ayurveda, okay. in addition to the allopathy. Okay. Yeah? okay. If it was uh, drama, dance, and stage shows, and so on, mm. how to give a place to the Maname and the Singhabaus and those dramatists who were coming up, the Sarachandras, mm. who were also doing something. Mm. And it was very visible, mm. this change, uh, if you observed it carefully, mm. it was very visible that mm. you were... But how were you, obviously, being the secretary to the Prime Minister, and then there was a civil service of other ministerial secretaries and that sort of... How did you, or the lot of you, were they seen to adapt to it naturally? Were there, were there ramifications on, on their tenures? I mean, were people asked to leave lock, stock and barrel? Or how, how did the civil service react to these changes coming from uh, Sir John's era to this year? Right. I think there was resistance, particularly from the civil service that little group of rather elite people who had come in and were manning the top positions. And they found it a little bit more intrusive. In the past, the, the elected officials, the ministers, mm. had allowed them to do virtually what they wanted. Yes. I mean, they trusted them and do what they want. Mm. But with the change over to the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and Mr. Bandar Naika, there was a much more intrusive look what are you doing? Are you really getting down to the people? Mm. Are you serving them? Are you serving yourself? Mm. And I think the public servant, some of them resisted this. Right. And of course, there was also the language issue that came up. Yes. That from working in English, yes. you were yes, now exactly. having to work in Sinhala. Mm. And many of them couldn't just adapt to it. Mm. And uh, after a while, mm. uh, Mr. Bananaka too decided that he wasn't going to push Sinhala that hard. Mm. You could have a little period of transition. Yes. So allowance was made for them to either come in, fit themselves for uh, the administration in Singhala, or move out. Yes. And many of them decided yeah. to move out. Right. No, that's that's uh, because we've, we've heard of this as young students, but then uh, coming from you, you, you've been there, mm -hmm. done that sort of thing. But unfortunately, the time we have uh, to discuss these, these tenures in detail is, is limited. So we're just going to rush mm -hmm. through stages and stages. Uh, I, 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 once again, Sri Lanka perhaps was unfortunate uh, to, to lose another good leader so prematurely. Uh, and we lost Mr. Bandar Naik to the shot of a gunman. But I, I was fascinated reading your memoirs in uh, Rendering Unto Caesar, the last words of Mr. Bandar Naik which you penned down. Uh, a foolish man dressed in the robe of a big fired some shots at me in my bungalow this morning. 
I appeal to all concerned to show compassion mm -hmm. to this man and not to try to wreak vengeance on him. Now these were the last words uh, after he was shot. And he goes on, I appeal to the people of my country to be restrained and patient at the time. I appeal to all to be calm, to, to those closely connected to me, to Mrs. Bandarnaik, my children, to members of the government, and all my friends and well-wishers, I make a particular appeal to be calm and to face the present situation with courage and fortitude. You want to reminisce a little bit on these last few? It was a very touching moment, a very poignant. Uh, it was almost a, a deathbed before the operation started that he made this statement to a, to a reporter. He had just been shot. He had just been shot. He was lying on a inside the, the merchant's ward. Uh, doctors were getting ready to, to operate on him and he was still conscious and he made this statement, which I think was extraordinary. I've never heard, I mean, ex except in, you really get, got to get to the saints to get a statement like that. It's a very noble statement and very thoughtful because it, the whole country could have exploded. I mean, here was a, a man dressed in robes. Uh, yeah. so maybe uh, some people would say a monk. Purporting to be a monk. Purporting to be a monk, yeah. comes and shoots him. And here is this man who in the middle of his pain is forgiving. Can forgive this, and in fact talk like the like a great, you uh, know, enlightened person, you know? compassion and love, mm. unbelievable. But almost, it was true. almost unbelievable. Almost to be unbelievable. A politician. But absolutely true, absolutely true. Because I was around yes. how it happened. Yes. No, um, wonderful words indeed, uh, and 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 like you say, it was a different era, different caliber, mm. different people. Um, but once again, very quickly before we go to the end of this segment, we have another Prime Minister's tenure that we have to get through with you. And that was in 59 and 60, a very short tenure of Prime Minister Dahanayake, W. Dahanayake. Uh, you describe him as a common man. Your, your thoughts? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bandanaka would have been an uncommon man, <laughs> <laughs> acting as a common man. Right. And I think what I'm trying to say there right. is that here was the common man himself, common not in a sense of, of law or anything yes. like that, but just That's coming the really type. from the people. Mm. No mm. birth of feudal status and mm. aristocracy, mm. not a semblance of that. Mm. Just mm. a man mm. who came from Gaul, mm. who wore his homespun cloth. <laughs> I, I want to come to that. A little more yes. naturalness than probably Mr. Banda and I can do. Yes. Because yes. this was his, his yes. stuff. His own, his own. His own. Now, <laughs> talking of homespun cloth, <laughs> I'm going to bring you to a, a comment at uh, page 62 of your memoirs. You, you speak of the time that Prime Minister Dhanayak wanted to enter the Houses of Parliament in his Amu day. <laughs> you want to recite this story for our viewers? Huh? Well, it was just, I think he wanted to make a statement yes. if, of protest. That at that time there was uh, perhaps a, a rationing or something. Of the rationing was all the all the of cloth, all, all, all the fashion in those days of right. cloth. And uh, you know, he just wanted to make the point that if you ration that much, <laughs> all he would be able to wear into Parliament would be this. Yes. He and didn't actually do it, but yes. I think he. So did he actually get through the House of Parliament? No, I don't think he did. I think the police would have stopped him. Right. But uh, he, he was a man who really wanted to act as he felt. Yes, but. Going from that, perhaps in lighter vein, on that making the point, to something that you, I, I was uh, uh, alerted to something you speak of uh, his tenure at Temple Trees. He he moves from mm. Savasti to Temple Trees, and then you you take him around to see the rooms, and and you say he says that the room you gave him was too big for him. <laughs> you, he wanted a smaller room, yes. and you couldn't find one. What happened? No, there were no other rooms. I mean, the small rooms were the servants' rooms yes. at the bottom. This is the room. This is a large prime ministerial suite. But he didn't want. He didn't want that. He had not slept in a room that size. <laughs> and he said, "Can you make me a smaller room?" Yeah. And finally, we had to get a carpenter in. Yeah. And within that large room, fashion a small room. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which is very yeah. odd. It inside the bigger room. <laughs> inside the bigger yeah. room. And he was very happy inside that. He yeah. had bed there and his little table. Yeah. It's okay there. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he enjoyed his tenure there. Yeah. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, a quick word. You also, whilst, whilst it was perhaps uh, a, a, a tenure in, in taken in lighter vein, and of course not that long, it was just 59 to 60, yes. uh, but there were several conspiracies that he had to deal with. Um, you speak of several. Uh, how 
how did he manage to do it? How was just, uh, you as, as, a, as a secretary uh, alerted to it? How did you all manage it? What were they? A, a brief word? Yes, I, I think this usually happens when assassinations or very dramatic events like that happen in the case of a political leader. And everybody wants to feel that uh, the actual incident itself was covered by other background and want to look at the background. I think it happened even in Rajiv Gandhi's case. It is a commission which examines the political ramifications of a particular action. Well, that brings us to the, the end of your first three tenures under three prime ministers. Uh, we have now, six more coming up, and uh, yeah, nine heads of state, seven prime ministers. We have six more coming up uh, in the company, in the very lovely and wonderful company of uh, Deshamani Bradman Virakon. Don't go away. We'll be back after a short break. Hello, and welcome back to this. Uh, Third segment, not the final segment of Checkmate, because as I said, we're in the wonderful company of the unique personality, a unique civil servant who's gone through nine heads of state and served under seven prime ministers. So the time we have uh, to cover their entire length and breadth of the career is not enough on one Checkmate. So after this um, particular part of our program, we're going to filter on to next week's Checkmate, where we're going to continue the dialogue from where we stopped today. But... Um, we now come, we've covered three tenures, sir. We've now come to the tenure, the uh, first tenure of Prime Minister Dudley Senanayak. Uh, before going into to what you had to grapple with as secretary, you were secretary to Prime Minister Senanayak uh, uh, under both tenures, 60 and 60 to 65 to 70. Um, you speak of the Senanayak family, FRDS, uh, as having been seen as somewhat of patriots, perhaps because of their, their affiliation to the movements mm -hmm. at the time. You want to describe a little bit of that family background that you speak of in the same light. Yes, I think they were, they were patriots and also quite uh, imbued with national sentiments. Uh, if you look at the history of their, their work in the, in the temperance movement and how they, how they actually opposed the British, they were very patriotic in, the, in that sense. Mm. They were not uh, gentry of the, of the who had borrowed or obtained favours from the British. They were just local gentry mm. uh, coming from Botale and mm. in that area of, mm. uh, of the Sierra. But of course Fone. then you, with that, with, in that same tone, you speak of um, some, uh, you call them strategic marriages of the time. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just a little comment on yes. what it is that you, that you speak of in this yes. time. Yes, I think the, they, they, they did try to advance the family fortunes by the kind of alliances that they made. Mm. This and was during that time, during everyone that period, in particular. That period, everybody was trying to do that. Yes. And it was a, a neat way of trying to link low country uh, perceptions well, and positions yes. with up country. Right. You know, the, the feudal or the, nobil, the, 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 the nobility, the traditions yes. of the nobility. Yes. And, and uh, you see, very often in, in that period of history, mm. you find these alliances going on. And yes. you, I call them strategic yes. because they, they, they benefited both parties. Yes, <laughs> yes of course. <laughs> um, then you also speak of, uh, of uh, Prime Minister Dati Senanayake's love of cricket and oh, yeah. perhaps lesser of golf, <laughs> as you were discussing, yes. but certainly of cricket and, and his days in school and that sort of thing. Oh, yes, he was a great athlete. Right. Dati Senanayake was uh, known in school, I think, in that school. For, for eating and, <laughs> and, and, for, and for sports. Right. But I remember a speech made in Parliament. He was a good speaker too. Like yes. All of these people were great speakers, mm. both languages. Mm. And he made this speech on what is called then the throne speech, throne speech. which is that, that was the, the determining factor yes. of whether the government went on yes. or got lost. Yes. Was I mean, if, you, if you were defeated in your throne speech, out went the government. Out went the government. Yes. If you were defeated, you were out. Yes. And this was a hopeless case because he was outnumbered. But the speech he made that day will live in my memory forever because it was a kind of fighting, pugnacious, mm. you know, taking it on with the op opposition. Mm. I really felt that the opposition, if they really listened, mm. could have come over. Yes. But they don't because yes. you, you, you work on party lines. Yes. But that showed his fighting quality that in, in, with this gentle demeanor that he had, mm. he also had a very strong fighting quality. Mm. And that came out very much mm. in the next Yes, Next. because 
ultimately that throne speech, although how wonderful it was, he, they were defeated. They were defeated. The guy and, and he resigned. He resigned and he resigned immediately. One of the great things about Dudley Sedenberg I noticed was that whenever he lost, whenever the referee said you are out or the umpire said you are out, noble in defeat, he just went away. He just put his head down, walked away. Hmm. I mean, no asking for replay uh, re <laughs> <laughs> or the third umpire. <laughs> just just walked away. Yeah. So I mean, that, that manifestation of the man. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so, but then uh, subsequently, uh, in sixty-five, seventy, he comes at the hut howler. The the, the, yes. the hat Hawler combination, or the hat Hawler and what we have come yes. to know as students of political yes. science, have, a little bit of word of that, of this whole hat Hawler, yeah, what that, is it? That was a very difficult, uh, fractious team of horses, all very bright and very eager to move on their own. But somehow, Federal Party included, he got the Federal Party also to stay with this hat Hawler mm. for at least three and a half years, yes. first time in history. The Federal Party, which had always been in opposition, mm. worked with the government. Uh, from 65, uh, in between, you go once again to a, from a, a UNP Prime Minister, mm. to whom you are Secretary. You become Secretary to Madam Sirimao Bandarnaik mm. of the SLFP regime. Uh, this, is the, this is what we will be discussing in our future segments in the oncoming weeks as to how a public servant remains or civil servant remains, despite governments coming in and, and going off. Uh, but didn't you, I mean, at, in one place, in fact, the question is posed to you, there's a criticism posed to you, coming in as uh, secretary to Mrs. Sirimao Bandar Naika, aren't you uh, the blue-eyed boy uh, uh, of, do you, want to, do you want to comment a little bit on how you managed in different regimes, different governments, different political visions, to remain that steadfast public servant. How did you do this? Right, I think that, that was a challenge all the time because everybody thought, I mean, people would think that you had worked with that other government and therefore were their servant and, and loyal to them in some way. And you yet had to maintain this loyalty. I was loyal, but my loyalty would be to a greater cause. There were people, the back of it. And, and most of these leaders did finally appreciate that. I mean, they appreciated the fact that, yes, you did, but you can do for me it as well. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's just uh, shifting, shifting your, your, not your allegiance, but, mm. but just shifting the kind of personality you work with mm. and give them your similar kind of straightforward. Give them all their due. All that. But yet you remain focused on the interests of the country. Interests of the country. How do I best serve the country? You know? mm. And I think that's the only way you can do it. You take it away from the, from the, from the kind of personality you serve. Mm. You like the personality. Mm. The trouble is that you are, after a while, mm. very strongly attached to that personality. Yes. When they lose, yes. you are terribly disturbed. I was. Yes. yes. But it couldn't be helped. Mm. Mm. They had done very well. They served me as, I served them as loyally as I could. But the country didn't feel that they deserved another term. Yes. And then they had to go and then retire. Into, so I think that was a very desirable way of looking at government. And I, I, I regret, mm -hmm. I really regret now, mm -hmm. that that ability to, to accommodate with the shifting of personalities, I regret it's that not that, prevalent. that's not prevalent mm -hmm. now. The, now, this would have been once again a, a, a unique uh, opportunity for you. The first woman prime minister of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, would have been a challenge. Mm. Talk to us a little bit about uh, oh, working I, with her. I, I, was, I was quite, I think, as I was then still relatively young, but I still remember how, uh, how, how, in a way, thrilled I was. You know, that here was an opportunity to 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 be of service to somebody for the first time in in human history. Mm. Who was going to be the leader of a country. I had, of course, known her a little at the time that she was the wife of yes. Mr. Bandaranaika. Yes. So I had that little advantage. Mm. And I had formed an opinion that Mrs. Bandaranaika had some qualities which could certainly serve very well in leadership. Mm. Mm. Firmness, mm. you know, decisiveness. Mm. Mm. In fact, I would say more decisive than even her husband. Mm. That if she determined on line of action, mm. did it. Mm. 
as far as the agenda was concerned, she had a ready-made agenda. The agenda was her husband's agenda. So she continued, she continued, she continued putting uh, his policies into, into, into place. Yes. And, 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 and some say very successful. Very successful. Yes. Uh, before we go on to, your, to, to the next tenure, because we got to catch up on, on three tenures and also no, three. your 70 to 77 era of your exile, as you call it. Uh, very quickly, you also make a comment uh, on Mrs. Bandar Naik's um, uh, steadfastness to the cause, as it were. You say she never had dressmakers or beauticians running after oh, yeah. her. Uh, she, she did her own. You want to comment? Yeah, I think she was very dignified in her dress, in her behavior, and uh, in, in a total absence of uh, showing off, you know, in, in any way. Her dress was very, very regal, mm -hmm. but absolutely what it was, was, was for a normal, uh, person of that of that status, mm. but you make particular point in your book. What made you say that that she didn't have she didn't have uh, companions to dress her or or, mm. or, or or people to dress her? What? Yeah, at the time of, at the time I was writing the yes. rendering, yeah. I think there were other experiences right. of people who had really done a little too much mm. in that respect. Mm. And here and was, you thought you'll make the point. Yeah, I thought I'd make the point that yes. she, she was very true to her, mm. to her origin. And, and you also make a, a very, very nice point that here was a head of state when she imposed uh, the, the, the ban on, or, or restrictions mm. on foreign exchange. Her eldest daughter, Sunetra, was, was to go to Cambridge, I believe, mm. for studies. Mm. And she did not want to bend the rule even for her, to, for her own daughter to take oh, the Oh, not, not, not at all, not at all. I mean, here was again a fear of... The public duty and, and what your personal loyalties to people are, even of your own family. I would remember even her brother would not want to ask her for a favor. He'd ask me to try and intercede on his behalf rather than, than, than go to her because she knew what she was doing. She would say, no, I can't do it because it wouldn't be fair. It is that basic sense of fairness and justice. So how did she actually get managed to get some money across the oh, she, she She found another way. She had a relative in, in London who could look after uh, the child and uh, you know, cater to that, those needs. And she did it that way. She was, was not going to, she was not going to get control of exchange to give her special permission to, to do that. This was the head of state. She was the head of state. Right, we come now quickly to your tenure. Uh, of course, 60, 65. And then you go back 65 to 70 under Prime Minister that Senaika, which we discussed. 70 to 77, you, you speak of your years of exile. But maybe before we come to that, I, I'd like to end that with that segment today. Uh, maybe you'd like to speak a little bit, uh, because you were not Secretary President Jayavardhana, uh, from the, the tenure of 70 to, 77 to 89, uh, there was a tenure of President Jaya Jayavardhana, first executive president, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the story is told in your book that you were asked what your expertise were, and you said public administration <laughs> and home affairs, and then you, you end up getting a, a, a plantation, plantation, plantation minister. You want to talk to us about Yeah, I think he told me uh, I, was, I had been outstation yes. you know, and came, came back, and yes. I knew a little bit about agriculture, mm -hmm. I knew a little bit about public administration. Yes. And he asked me, he said, uh, he used to call him Bradman, he said, Bradman, uh, I've got vacancies in four positions. Mm. Um, I've got defense. I said, no, sir, please. I, I don't like defense. Yes. I said, why? He said, no, I'm, I'm a very pacific kind of man. <laughs> I, I can't go around shooting people or yes. asking people to be shot. So, yes. no, no defense. Yes. Then uh, he said, I, I can do home affairs. He said, no, anybody can do that. Yeah. What about plantations? <laughs> he said, have you any plantations? Yeah. And I said, I think I have an acre or two somewhere. <laughs> said, well, that's the man for me. You look after planting. And I got to, had to look after about 700,000 acres. A secretary minister of planting. A secretary minister of planting. And also you get a, a special reference to the Indian fact. Uh, mm. you, you see a definite shift mm. in, in our strategic uh, handling of our foreign relations, mm. particularly with our big neighbor, India, mm. during this tenure. You want to comment a little bit? A little bit on that, because but what, what was going on, I think, at that time that Mr. Jayawan thought of it, was that India might be, he thought, might have some designs through, through the fact that there was this, uh, the, 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 the liberal movements of the Tamils were starting off. Mm. And to really cut those two mm. at the same time, you know, as encourage relations with us, mm. he got India into a new deal with us, mm. which was the Industry Lanka Pact. Yes. Now, you have served the several heads of state as secretary. Suddenly, you're sent away. These are the terms that you referred to earlier. 
that you didn't see anything wrong with it. You, you're a public servant. You're supposed to go and serve where you're told to serve. Talk to us about that era. Of yeah, I, I'm surprised that it didn't happen earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but it had, to, it had to come at some time. And in fact, I was wanting, to, I, I had missed something in my life. My life had been centered around temple trees, these big people. And I knew there was a lot of activity going on on the periphery. And suddenly, out of the blue, as it were, with a change of government, came this wonderful opportunity of go out and serve in the, in the least hospitable part of the country you can find, which is Ampara. Yeah. Ampara was quite desolate at that time. Mm. And uh, we discussed it with my wife, and she said, why not? I mean, there's enough of this. Mm. This has been a life of really like bed and roses, okay? Let's go and enjoy the fun out there. Mm. And we got some very good times there. Mm. Seven years in the wilderness, as in some, in one sense. Yes, but Mr. Virakondo, uh, it's just, I, I admire you for, for looking at it this way, and, 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 but we, we, uh, we are seen, we, 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 we see what happens around us. We see um, very highly placed public servants, uh, as you were to, to several regimes, to several heads of state, secretary to the head of the state. Mm. Suddenly you're asked to go and serve in Ampar, shun from the limelight. How did you get yourself to react to this the way you did? I mean, you took and we admire you for it, which is why you're here, we are interviewing you. And we admire you for having done that. How did you gear yourself to do this? Right. I, th I think I just felt that uh, here was a chance to do, have another life. I mean, here was another great life to have with people, farming, irrigation, learning about new things. I. I, in Did my, you have to deal with a lot of criticism or people talking behind your back? Hey, he's oh, yes. fallen from grace. Oh, sure, sure. And people said, you know, he's nobody now. You know, he's, he's got no power at all. Now. How did you deal with? Well, they, 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 you know, make make sure they had power bases elsewhere. You know, <laughs> at people, and people were very nice to me, and I made lots of friends. I made friends among the Muslims and the Tamils. I learned some Tamil too by mm. being in the Batiklo area, mm. and. Uh, I learned a great deal. I think I managed to see also some of the diversity of Sri Lanka. I began to see hmm. that uh, the Sinhalese were not the only thing that mattered, that there were these Tamil people and the Muslim people, and they were getting on very well in, hmm. in some places. Hmm. And it was a great learning experience for me. Well, uh, as I said before, we are in the wonderful company. We are privileged and honored to have this uh, Sri Lanka civil servant par excellence in, in our studios tonight as our guest on Checkmate. As you know, uh, our success of the production team, uh, which we are very grateful uh, for your responses and the ratings that have been climbing, uh, the success has been very much due to the production team in being very careful and meticulous in the selection of our guests. As you would have seen, we've had the creme de la creme. We've been fortunate enough to have the best of Sri Lanka, uh, to, to come to our studios, share their experiences with you so that the present and future generations of Sri Lankans out there may learn, uh, aspire to emulate, to take this country to the pristine glory that, that it once was, uh, where it ought to be uh, very soon. Uh, and, and, and that is the whole ethos of Checkmate. And so we are, we are extremely grateful to Mr. Bradman Weirakon for sharing his time with us. Unfortunately, we've... Uh, we uh, have to bring it to a close tonight. But as I said, uh, we will be back with you next week, continuing his uh, three other ten years under three different heads of state, and then his vision for the future uh, of the public service, of the government and public service divide, and, uh, and, and several other areas that I'm sure you'll be interested in from his perception as a civil servant or a public servant of the state. So uh, with that, I bid you uh, adieu. Uh, for this week, once again, Checkmate continues in the company of Deshamani Bradman Virakon. Next week, uh, do keep writing in to us. Uh, our email address.